Welcome to Breaking the Line, the ECNL podcast, a bi-weekly look at all things related to the growing elite clubs nationally, the ECNL. For more information on the ECNL, visit us at www.theecnl.com. Now, here's your host for Breaking the Line, the ECNL podcast, former U.S. soccer press officer and longtime soccer broadcaster, Dean Linky. I am Dean Linky, but when you work with great people like the people at the ECNL, you let them do their thing. Jason Cutney, the ECNL Boys Commissioner, does such a great job filling in as the host of this show. I love when he brings on great guests, and I love the questions that he asks. It's no different today as I turn it over to my main man, Jason. This is Jason Cutney, Commissioner of ECNL Boys. Honored to have the ECNL Boys and ECNL Girls National Coaches of the Year on this edition of Breaking the Line, the ECNL Podcast. And this is Ralph Richards, proud to be the ECNL Girls Commissioner and honored to have won this year's ECNL National Girls Coach of the Year for my work at St. Louis Scott Gallagher. And this is Danny Tones from San Diego Surf, proud to be the ECNL Boys National Coach of the Year and join Jason and Ralph on this week's edition of Breaking the Line, the ECNL podcast. So there you have it, Jason Cutney with this year's Girls and Boys ECNL National Coaches of the Year. And it all starts after this message from the ECNL. As the game continues to evolve in the United States, the ECNL remains the standard of excellence in youth soccer. The Elite Clubs National League has grown to include over 200 clubs and nearly 50,000 players across the country with a robust competition platform for teams, educational resources for coaches and clubs, and unparalleled identification and development opportunities for players. Alongside its member clubs, collaborating to create a better future, the ECNL continues to raise the game every day. The ECNL is more than a league. Welcome back to Breaking the Line, the ECNL podcast. Once again, here's Dean. Thank you, Dean. Yes, this is Jason Cotney, ECNL Boys Commissioner. Very excited for today's show. I'm really honored to be joined here by two coaches this year that I've gotten to know one a little bit more closely than the other, which I'll explain in a second, but two coaches that certainly have breakout seasons left their mark on the ECNL in a very major way, one of which on the boys' side was part of three national championship teams this year for the ECNL, which I'm not sure that has ever happened before that I can speak of, that's for sure. And on the other side, winning back-to-back national championships, which again, puts these guys in categories that I will never be in, I don't think, unless the the pre-ECNL has a national championship this year and I might have a chance. But Danny Tonks, ECNL Boys National Coach of the Year from San Diego Surf, and Ralph Richards, ECNL Girls National Coach of the Year, who is at St. Louis, Scott Gallagher. Danny, Ralph, welcome to the show. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for having us, Jason. Absolutely. So we have a crazy American soccer story here. We have two Englishmen that have made their way to the United States to influence the game. I've never heard this before. This must be a brand new thing here. Uh, it's the first time. First time it's ever happened. happened. First time this happened. But when you look at this and you look at the impact in the United States and soccer, England obviously takes a uh, a big part of that in terms of the culture, what the English Premier League especially brings to inspiration for our players. You guys are coming from England. You're coming to the United States. You're bringing a mentality, a mindset, a culture with you. You step into the United States. How did you get into U.S. soccer, right? Let's talk about that first. So, Ralph, we'll we'll start with you. I, I believe you came over from a college experience standpoint, but what was your entry point to soccer in the United States? Back in 1997, 1997, and uh, wasn't really doing the typical, the usual kind of format of like growing up playing the game over in England, kind of developed a little bit later. So I didn't, wasn't involved in the academies, if you will. And so then I started playing in the semi-professionals with the men's at 16. Danny probably can remember some of this old, old time kind of soccer And then it was at that point that, you know, I realized that university was probably the best path for me moving forward. So as we were just chatting there, I was thinking about going to Leeds University. And then someone reached out to me from the United States at the University of Indianapolis. And then basically just said, hey, if you would be interested, we've got a few guys that are over here already from the UK. 
you want to come over? And my buddy was down the road and he was, he was already set to go. So I quickly did the, the ACTs and all gets all, get all that stuff done, which that was a, a brand new experience to me. Absolutely. Passed it. And next thing you know, I'm, uh, I'm flying over and taking the bus down to, uh, from Middlesbrough to London and then flying over and that was it. The rest is history. You ended up almost going to Leeds. That that yeah. will pivot here to Danny. So Danny, you, you ended up going to Leeds, right? And after that, you found an entryway into the United States. So talk us through that piece for you. Yeah, I mean, I was actually, I was at Leeds Met. I've got to say that, two universities there. So uh, I've got to say Leeds Met on that. But I was at Leeds Met and um, I'd just been playing with Mansfield Town and a um, bit of coaching there, a bit of coaching at Barnsley Football Club as well. Started getting into coaching and joined the university as well with kind of adult way a little bit, just a bit of everything really. Um, and long story short, I, I came out to America with somebody offering me a chance to come out. We built a connection, me and another, uh, another coach called Adam Lamb, who's actually director at the uh, ECNL club in, in Kansas city. We were, you know, really, really working hard together and, and we, worked to uh, Michigan, went to Michigan, worked there for a Midwest Soccer Academy, brought a bunch of coaches coming out from UK and, and Holland. So I had a lot of experience there. We worked with a club and, and really just built it from the ground up, um, a small club in, in Michigan. Together, we worked on it, worked hard and, and just tried to, you know, really improve standards and professionalism that we'd kind of learned from the academy's, you know, system back home and, and everything else. So we were there, and, and then since then, we've kind of gone on to, we, we get to a point where we had to kind of maybe move into a different direction to progress, and then that was kind of what brought me over to to San Diego, which I've been here for the last nine years, so been a pretty good switch from Michigan all the way through to San Diego. Keep it with you for a second, Danny. You come over, you kind of land in the middle of the country here in the United States, so you know, a, lot, a lot of times people show up on the East Coast or the West Coast, you, you happen to fall right into the middle of this place, similar to Ralph in some ways there. What were your first takeaways? I mean, when you, you know, you're building a club from scratch after some time with Midwest, but when you started that process, were you in shock? Were you, you know, did you feel like there was no, no bright light at the end of this tunnel at any point? Or did you feel like the, the pieces were there? You just needed to really roll up the sleeves and get after it. Yeah, I think so. I think that, you know, was more the the ethos with it really it was just, we were younger, we were, you know, energetic. We were just very passionate to be, you know, driven to make it work, right? And we were working with people in communities, smaller communities. We had to kind of just build a kind of a homegrown talent, really. We we couldn't bring players from all over the place. I mean, the, there's established clubs in Michigan, which we all know about. So we had to really focus on the standards. And yeah, like I said, really from the ground up and the players we had bought into it, the board, the parents, the everything, the, the staff that was there, you know, was kind of almost recreational to a point. Um, and then we we touched, we kind of turned it into a professional organization with a lot of help from a lot of people. And then we built it. And I think really from there, we we learned, me and Adam, we, we learned that we had to really build curriculum and younger side first. You know, that was a real big key to it um, because we, kept, we had more control over that. Um, and we could really build the teams, the players, the development, all those things kind of how we wanted it to be. And, and then from there, it kind of progressed and snowballed to a point where, like I said, we had to probably after a few years of doing that, everyone was professional. Uh, we kind of had to move off because we, we kind of took it really probably as far as we could, being honest. So that that was where it was at. And it was a great environment for us because we learned so much on the job. We were young. We were, we like I said, hungry, but we had to learn mistakes. We had to, you know, be directors. We had to do all these things and um, like I said, learn from it, just learn, you know, and, and we had our standards, but we also had to learn. So that was a big pe a big key thing that's kind of kept my kind of grounding uh, as I've gone through working with younger kids at surf through to the oldest kids at surf um, at all different levels. You know, and I think that, you know, you, you come from the academy system in, in England and it's great, but the America is completely different, you know, and, and we need to kind of, well, I need to kind of try and, take the stuff that I liked from the academy system and bring it into the culture here in America. That's kind of how I've, I've kind of had my, you know, base and platform of, of my coaching journey, really. 
Well, it's interesting you bring up Adam Lamb. I mean, Adam, obviously, with Casey Scott Gallagher and, you know, the 18-19 the national championship this year for you guys was was a matchup of San Diego Surf and Casey Scott Gallagher. And, you know, Adam has certainly done a great job of building that club. And, and you look at Scott Gallagher in general, Casey Scott Gallagher is built from SLSG, right, from St. Louis Scott Gallagher, where Ralph is and, and has been. Ralph, we'll turn to you. I mean, you, you went to University of Indianapolis, right? You come out of that. You, I think you joined, you, you initially started to become a personal trainer, right? And then that is like, correct. Oh, first, yes. first job, you know, body by Ralph coming out of college. What led to the soccer piece in, in the youth game? And always interested to ask this, did you start on the girls' side initially or were you on the men's side, boys' side? So I'll quickly answer that and then I'll get back to it. But I did start on the boys' side. Terrible experience. Get there in a minute. Mm-hmm. Personal trainer coming out of college. I think as we, you know, from overseas, there's not a lot you can do to earn some extra money as a student, right? You have to work either on campus or you can do some like clinics and things like that. So I got into a little bit of doing some clinics, enjoyed the coaching aspect. At some point, someone reached out and said, hey, you need to get a hold of, you need to reach out to Russell G. He works with Karma United on the girl side. And I said, okay, I'll, 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 I'll address it when I'm graduating or later on. Another coach came up to me and said, I've got a boys team, U17 boys team at Dynamo. It's a second level, but come on in, just come out a couple of times a week. So I started there. And actually, what's funny is one of the guys that I coached, he lives in St. Louis. He's actually a coach now at the uh, at Gallagher. So I coached him. His dad was the manager for the team. I was a coach, Coach Tommy. And uh, now he's an actual coach himself. So kind of I bumped into him in St. Louis. Crazy, small world, as they say, on the boys' side. But that was basically a one-year kind of stopgap as I was then going back into the fall coaching. And then at the end of the fall, as I was graduating, that's when someone said, hey, why don't you reach out to Russell now and get it on the girls' side? So that's where I started my uh, coaching career. It was a U14 girls team after the U17 boys experience uh, the year before. So, you know, and it just took off. It took off from there. You know, Russell was a, a great guy, a mentor uh, for me, no question about it. He taught me a lot of things. When you come into coaching, you're not quite sure which way to go and how to do it. And again, you learn from your mistakes. As Danny was saying there, you just kind of coach and make a mistake and you kind of adapt just like a player does. And I think uh, he was great to have on the sideline with me. He helped me along the way. And I met a a lot of great guys there in Indianapolis uh, coaching with uh, Russell G. So uh, it was a good start and the the club was in a good place. And the girls side really just kind of took off and over at Common United. Now it's known as Indiana Fire, and it's still, obviously, now it's in the ECNL as well. So a lot of the coaches are still there. Russell went down into the challenge in different places, and now he's back here in Indianapolis as well. So I get to see my mentor every now and then when we're out and about. So When you first started, though, you had a year at, at SLU as well, correct, in the college game? Yeah, so I was with Come United for eight to ten years now, and then that's when Scott McDaniel, who's the girls' director at Gallagher, and Steve Petcher, I bumped into them at a tournament and I was kind of considering a new path, coaching path and going into the collegiate game. And so at that point, Kat Mertz was the new head coach there. Katie Shields, who's the current coach, she was the assistant and they were looking to hire a second assistant, kind of a part-time role. So it was going to be perfect for me if I wanted to go to St. Louis Scott Gallagher, I could go and do both together at the same time. So they worked it out tremendously uh, well. I ended up going and uh, I did, I, I did a year there. It was, it was fun. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the the college coaching lifestyle, if you will. But even though I was getting up at say five o'clock coaching in the morning, doing all of that, the traveling on the weekend, I loved my sessions with the youth kids. You know, I loved it. Six o'clock at night, seven o'clock, eight o'clock at night, going and training with the U14s. And I could only do the younger age groups then because of the 50 mile rule in the, uh, the college system. So, yeah, I was training and and basically that's it, it was a one year deal for me just because of that. I knew where my passion was. I knew what I wanted to do and I wanted to to stay with uh, Scotty and Petch and help the girls program at Gallagher uh, go in the direction that it is today. All right, well, a good opening segment here with our 2023 ECNL Coaches of the Year, Ralph Richards and Danny Thompson. We'll be right back after a word from our partners. 
Nike is a proud sponsor of ECNL Girls. Nothing can stop what we can do together to bring positive change to our communities. You can't stop sport because hashtag you can't stop our voices. Follow Nike on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Soccer.com is proud to partner with the ECNL to support the continued development of soccer in the U.S. at the highest levels. We've been delivering quality soccer equipment and apparel to players, fans, and coaches since 1984. Living and breathing the beautiful game ourselves, our goal at Soccer.com is to inspire you to play better, cheer louder, and have more fun. Visit Soccer.com today to check out our unmatched selection of gear, expert advice, and stories of greatness at every level of the game. And we are back with Breaking the Line, the ECNL podcast. This is Jason Putney, the ECNL Boys Commissioner. Again, here with Danny Tonks and Ralph Richards, the 2023 ECNL Coaches of the Year. Before the break, we were talking a little bit about what brought these two gentlemen to the United States, how they got involved in soccer. Now let's kind of dive in a little bit more to this year, right? It's obviously a special year for both of them, as we said in the, uh, the beginning here. Danny, I'm going to start with you. Three national championships for surf this year. The overall club champions on the boys' side. This happened to be your first year where you came to ECNL boys from the ECNL girls, which is interesting, and I want you to touch on that. Is there a direct correlation here between you coming to the boys' side and then all of a sudden the three national championship trophies are hoisted? It's got to be something to do with it. What it tell us about? I've got to stay humble on this one. No, the, the guys who, who've been around for the last few years have have built a really good program. The current staff has been quite consistent with the, the head coaches we have. Josh Henderson, who's our who's our director, he's he's kind of been his thing when he first came to surf, which has been what seven years ago. He he kind of was obviously coming from the boys' side and really made an emphasis with with building that. So there's been layers, right? There's been layers that have kind of been added to it throughout the years, and they've had good years and maybe not so good years, kind of as we all do. But me coming in, it was great because it's a it was kind of a new challenge and i felt like i could bring a lot of the stuff that i kind of had worked with the girls obviously the surf's been a great girls program for years and years and i think there's a lot in the girls game that that is valued that you can take into the boys game of course um i think that the culture and the learning habits and, and things like that from the girls side is is very highly valued as a coach and i think that on the boys side trying to take some of those things over because I think sometimes with the boys, they want to play, they want to play, they want to play. And I think trying to get that balance of, you know, letting them, them have their moments to be free and play with, with teaching and learning and then kind of encompassing that with the kind of culture uh, that you, again, the values that we took from the, the girls side has been great. And also with that, I would say just the game model itself that we had on the girls side, you know, some of the layers that we've had from the girls' side that works with the girls. Some of that I interpreted to kind of bring onto the boys with the, with the group I had with the 19s. That was great. I think that that gave them kind of a new push that's something they maybe not have had for a while, just having a new voice and new kind of ideas. Like, again, from my history as a coach, I feel like trying to build a culture within the staff is really important. The guys we have are great. So for me, just to kind of try and empower those guys you know, keep it organized, keep it proactive and and have daily, weekly conversations about football, right? About soccer, That that's huge. Just so that we kind of spark that kind of, you know, quality and, and passion in the game from all the coaches. And it worked, right? It worked. And, and I think that there's no magic formula. I haven't got a, a magic formula. I think it's just kind of the principles of, of the hard work and the attitude of everybody, players, staff, with the layers that we had before, you know, and um, a little bit of luck on the way, let's be honest, you know, some of those games were really tough. The summer competition was incredible. So we managed to find a way and um, we got three, right? Which is great. So it is it, not very often as a coach you get, or as a director, you get to get success. Let's be, let's be honest. And there's a lot of directors and coaches out there that work extremely hard and they don't get recognition of an award or a, a championship or all those things that doesn't mean that they're not good you know it just means that you know they they haven't had their moment so we had that moment this year and hopefully now we can progress it that that's the big thing for us now we we don't want to stand still and admire it we want to progress and and a lot of work already this season has been trying to re kind of re go again and re-energize and re get some newer ideas and get some newer cultural things in the in the program so that we 
we want to build on it. We don't want it to just be, a, you know, one year, three and done. Like we want to, we want to make it as, as good as we can so it can be sustainable for, for a long time. And so we, we, a lot of times in the coaching world, we talk about well-rounded players, you know, and, and I think at the, at the pro level, you see obviously much less of this than you do at the youth levels. And I'm coaching as Ralph knows on the, on the very young ages now with the pre CNLs with my daughters. And it's interesting this past weekend, we were playing games and my group was in firm control of the game in the first half. Half time came around and I changed everything. So all the defenders started as attackers. All the attackers started as defenders and just mixed up the partnerships in the center midfielders. And the second half was an absolute mess to start, you know, for 15 minutes of just bedlam. They had no idea. And I, we explained afterward, you know, you had to kind of find your way. You had to figure it out. You had to, you know, see that the same principles really are at play no matter if your angle is everything in front of you or if it's all around you or if it's on the sideline or whatever. And I think that a lot of that's true with what you just said. I, I'm I'm interested to ask though that move from the girls' side to the boys' side. What prompted it? You know what 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 led to that? Because obviously you're then challenging yourself as a youth coach to to change. You've been very successful, as you said, on the girls' side of surf. I mean, it's one of the top clubs in the country every single year. So there's a comfort with that, right? And there's a comfort zone. But what prompted that decision to look at to the boys' side? I'm lucky enough that I've I've held quite a few roles in in surf, and and I know that being nine years pretty much at, at one club is not normal, right? I think there's a lot of coaches that, you know, kind of are in a three, four year cycle and then they kind of look for a new challenge, right? So I, I've had that experience in history at Surf. I, I've I've had different roles, be it the youngers. I started with a U7 boys B and C team coming from being a director of a club to then coaching a U7 boys C team straight off the jump. And it was, it was tough. So I had to kind of, you know, like I said, learn all those kind of ways to, you know, be a better kind of coach, but as also as a director. And I think the club saw that uh, I was a, the director of kind of working with another uh, coach with Craig Barkley and Andy Brookfield with the, with the zone one, uh, which is our younger program. So we kind of ran that. And then we, I kind of moved it into the older side with the ECRL and, and things like that. And I actually had a little bit of a stint with the ECNL girls director as well. A few years ago, I, when we had a, we had a group that went to the final back in, I think it's 2018. So we, we, we had a, I've had a, a lot of experiences. What I'm trying to say of trying to be a good coach and director and trying to have that responsibility. And I think that Josh, our director saw that and, and kind of gave me the, you know, the opportunity. He was like, look, you know, this makes sense, right? We've got, this, this, and this in place. I, I'd like you to come in and, and kind of use that that kind of organization and everything else to to really do it. And I was like a little bit, mm, okay, I don't know, right? Because when you make a jump in a, in your career, it's it's always it's always daunting, right? Like you 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 kind of have to weigh it up. So I, I did. I weighed it up and 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 took it and just obviously embraced it and and tried to be as best I could and it's worked out well, right? Like we've had a lot of good success and the players, man, the, the players have been amazing. The boys have been great, you know, and I've had a lot of experience working with boys before. And I didn't, as a coach, really want to kind of pigeonhole myself into just one or the other. So it was good for me just to kind of have that fresh outlook and and take, well, like I said, what I learned from the girl side onto the boys and 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 then try and evolve even more now with the boys. So that's kind of how it was. It was a good opportunity, took it. And it worked, right? It's just worked so far. And now I've just got to kind of, now the hard work starts again, got to go again. So right, well, speaking of doing it again. Seemed like a, seemed like a good decision though, Danny. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. I like to say that I think, I think like I said, there's a lot of coaches that work really hard and directors that re work really hard and you win one and you kind of like to think that it's kind of maybe an award for kind of the hard work you've done throughout the whole of the time. Maybe it's a bit of luck as well, but it works. It something clicked and um, I'm super appreciative of, of everything. Now, again, now we go again. That's, that's all it has to be. Stay humble, go again. And um, I'm looking forward to that. Perfect segue for Ralph. So Ralph has gone again <laughs> for, for all the listeners. Obviously I think, you know, Ralph is the commissioner on the girls side. He joined us last year at the end of the end of last season. He was up for coach of the year on the girls' side last year. The ECNL was like, nah, we can't, we can't possibly give it to Ralph. He just joined his ECNL commission. And of course, it goes out and wins it again to make it even more difficult for everybody. But you know, Ralph certainly deserved wins back-to-back -back national championships, 
I guess the question is for you, Ralph, like when you win one, as you did last year, there's a certain, and I don't want to say comfort level, but there's a certain point you reach where you're like, we did it. We did it. It's done. You know, like we've, we've got it. It's we've, we've notched that one. We've done it. It's we're, we're good to go. That first training session back the next year, you're still riding that high. At what point in the season did you start to look at this thing and say, like, we got to dig a little bit deeper this year to, to pull this off again? Because you know everyone's gone in for you. That's that's an obvious. You become the New York Yankees straight away, which as a Yankee fan is tough to say this season because of the season we're having. But you become that team that everyone wants to beat that circles on the calendar. At what point in the season did that switch where you're like, we got a chance, but we got to do a few more things? I mean, I don't know. It, for one, it didn't sink in for a long, long time. And I think a lot of that was – taking on the new role as the girls commissioner, you know, the, the hours and we're, we're doing a lot of things like that. And then back on the field, at the, you know, coaching the girls at the same time, these girls were getting ready to do their visits. So for the first two months, I never had every single one of the players in a training session for the first two months, either they were injured or they were just, everyone was out doing visits and trying to get themselves ready for that college in that class of uh, 24 back then. So during that time, I was like, man, we, we're going to be struggling just to get to the Champions League. But we kept playing games and they they kept winning and they just kept, you know, moving along to keeping the train moving forward, so to speak. But the girls were kind of struggling with it. They were really emotionally struggling with it. And, you know, Danny touched on a little bit with culture and girls. And one of the areas that they were struggling with was dealing with that pressure. Because that the bullseye on your back to your point, Jason. I remember specifically, we were out at Creve Corps training session. I've got my other two teams, and we were doing kind of three teams together, and one team was down there with Scotty working on some other aspects of the game. And they just were a little bit quiet. And Scotty actually pulled them in. He said, What's going on? And then the girls just started venting. And next thing you know, they're just going off and off and off. I wasn't in the conversation. And we had another conversation later. And it was just school. But now seniors, some of them are juniors. There's a lot of things like that that they were going through. The pressures of the commitment. Players that they were younger going, well, are these guys going to work for us this season just as much as we did for them? So they all just got it off the chest. And it was a turning moment. And so we went into the ballroom at the Worldwide Soccer Park. And we sat there and we had a really, really good conversation with them. And we just all let it out. As a coach, we let it out just as... You know, this is what we're seeing. This is what we're thinking. Why don't you take the floor and you have say what's on your mind? And it was really, really eye-opening. And we've done a lot of that because we have, as a program, we've we invested into what drives winning. And so we talked a lot about openness and culture and things along that and working on being good people. So we were able to have these really honest conversations with one another. So I think then we were getting ready to go into our showcase season now. We're going into November. We've played the majority of the games. We still, we were undefeated again coming out. So we hadn't dropped a point. And we go in there and we're playing all the, 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 big, the big teams that you want to play in the showcases. And the showcases were fine. And the girls that were committed, they were working so, so hard in the games and really competing. So the younger ones were like, all right, this is, this is real. And I could sense that there was now a change in their attitudes and how they were working in training because they really wanted to do something special again. The reality is for girls that play the club soccer in the fall, you lose them for three months. You lose them for three months. So you don't know what they're going to come back like, not from lack of playing, but it's more, are they exhausted? Are they injured? Do they have the right mindset to, to do it again? To your point, Danny, to do it again, to go again. I was not sure. I went into the postseason with that team thinking we might be lucky to get out of our group play. We had three or four different injuries that would knock the team, like those players were not playing. They did, they did not participate one minute. A couple of girls were carrying some significant injuries where they could only play a bit and they were fighting through it. Like one girl's playing on a, a labrum tear in her hip. I mean, she's playing through a labrum tear in her hip just to try to help her team. Another girl was out with a knee injury. Another girl was recovering from a knee injury, an ACL, which happened last summer. So going into it, I had no idea what we were going to, how it was going to go. We even brought a couple of different players up. We moved them up in the window. And so they came in, they left their team, and they came over to into the Navy. 
and they really had a huge impact on the on the roster as well. So I don't know if I thought we were going to win it, but when we had it was the first game and Virginia Union, I, I we played them once before, and it ended up being I think it was seven nil and Pfeiffer, if you know Pfeiffer, Alex Pfeiffer. She scores a double hat trick, and I'm like, all right, this kid is locked in. Like she is, she's she's firing. And so, when you got a player like that, supported by some of the other players that we have, with great players, and the back line was fantastic, and goalkeeping has always been a steady, consistent for for that group. Then you started to think, okay, now we can get to the next round, and then you know we go from there. Really, an unbelievable year. I was, you know, on the, on the boys' side, able to watch firsthand surf. Kind of move through and, and win three. Ralph, I kind of lived the the girl side through your journey just because we're in communication with each other every minute of every single day now because of our our jobs. But a, a special year nonetheless for all for both of you guys. And you know, the, it's a good way to end our second segment here, breaking the line, the ECL podcast. When we return on, for the last segment, we'll dive a little bit deeper into just what helps these guys move through their journeys, through their coaching careers, through the leadership side of what they do in the game. And we'll be right back after this break. The ECNL is pleased to announce Quick Goal as the official goal provider and partner for ECNL Girls and ECNL Boys, a new partnership created to support the growth and development of the country's top players, clubs, and coaches. At all national events, including national playoffs and national finals, the Quick Goal Coaches Corner will provide hospitality and social space for ECNL girls, ECNL boys, and collegiate coaches. Quick Goal will also be the presenting sponsor of the National championship winning ECNL girls and ECNL boys coaches of the year and the ECNL girls and ECNL boys goals of the year. Quick Goal looks forward to helping the ECNL continue to elevate the standards of youth soccer and provide more opportunities to players on and off the field in the coming years. From athletes just starting to turn heads to some of the best athletes to ever play their games, Gatorade shows that they are the proven fuel of the best. For the athletes who give everything, nothing beats Gatorade. The studied, tested, and proven fuel of the ECNL. And we are back with the final segment here of Breaking the Line, the ECNL podcast. I am here with Ralph Richards, the ECNL Girls Coach of the Year, and Danny Tonks, the ECNL Boys Coach of the Year. Talk through the first two segments just about what got them to the United States and, and then about this past year. We'll dive a little bit now into just kind of what kind of fuels these guys. You know, it, it's every coach has a different thing. Every athlete has a different thing. Every parent has a different thing in many ways. But when you look at this from a coaching perspective, interested, just we do a lot as soccer coaches, right? And all the, all, a lot of the listeners are soccer coaches uh, for this podcast. There's a lot of time spent away from the field that you just, I don't think it can ever be quantified or appreciated to the amount of stress and strain that it takes to lead a team, right? Because you're leading a bunch of individual lives that are all heading in different directions in some way, shape or form. And you're trying to galvanize them around a, a certain idea or methodology or playing style or whatever, right? A, a vision of yours that you're sharing with others. When you look back at this past year, well, Danny, we'll start with you. 50 years from now, God willing, we're still alive. Ralph won't be, he's, he's way too old. We know that, but 50 years from now, you think back on this. What's one thing you remember about this year? Loaded question that. Probably the overall togetherness of everyone, right? And at the right time. I think the groups, the players with exceptional leadership, let me add, is is with the 19s that I had were, were incredible. The togetherness that they showed, they they all had a motivation that was, you know, that was, we loved, we, we fed off it as coaches. That was incredible. The togetherness of the, of the program, you know, like I said, with the, the staff that we have, the players, like I said, they work hard, man. They, they, they work, you know, three, four, five days a week of, of, of training. We ask them to do a lot, be it with the ball or performance training or whatever it is. And, you know, just the togetherness of it all when it clicks is the part that you remember, I feel, right? I think that when you score those last minute goals or you win a championship and, you know, and I say this to coaches a lot is, 
enjoy that enjoy it you work hard enjoy it enjoy those moments so the big kind of term for me was just the togetherness of it all and uh, being with the coaches being with the assistant coaches being with the players at all different age groups we it was it was great because we had actually had the youngest the middle and the oldest so we had a real good representation of all the age groups so that was fun to see that you know how how the how the youngest age group came together and then how the middle and then obviously how the oldest completely different mindsets you know in, in a sense different methodology and and game model really for a lot of them and, and the depth of it but there was one key thing was the togetherness and um they they stuck in there we had close games where they had to just be together and it worked and and they managed to find a way to win those games and um so that's probably the biggest takeaway for me is is just remembering that togetherness of everybody what do you think ralph i mean there's no question that togetherness in a group is is obviously key right and if you have that good culture and i think i highlighted for in the last segment was the one point would have been that meeting that meeting at soccer park with the girls i think them being able to open up about where they were and how they were feeling allowed them to kind of move forward i would say the big thing for me as far as why this team was successful this year, I would think it was a buy-in by the rest of the club or the program inside or the players inside our program. And I say that because I, I mentioned that we had to move two of our green players into the Navy, move them up because of the injuries. And that was, they'll be there this season. And then at the same time, we had to move going into the finals because of a couple more injuries. We moved in 08 into the 06s. And then we brought up our own nine goalkeeper to sit the bench and travel all the way to Richmond and be the backup to Caroline as the goalkeeper. Luckily, she wasn't needed, but she's a very good goalkeeper. She was at the uh, um, Conference Cup this summer, um, actually. So she's very accomplished in what she does. But how cool is that, that young players can be a part of the older experience? And that's going to go a long way for her. So I would say the big take for me was the the involvement of the entire program from the nines all the way through the sixes. And quite frankly, the sixes only become who they are in training because of every day they get pushed on them by the O fives and the O fives were training with them side by side. And every single day they would, they would train and play and against each other all, all the time. So in fact, the O the O sixes could never beat the O fives at 10 V eight or 76 or some sort of small sided Game. They could never beat them ever on a Thursday night in preparation. So that's the uh, 05s are always like, yeah, you still can't beat us. Still can't beat us. But that's it. I think it's the program. And it goes to your point, Danny, as well, that, you know, you need this methodology of kind of working the kids from here to here to here. And we have a similar one, but a lot of ours is the same. It's just a matter of a little, little less complex at the younger and more complex at the older's. But the pathway of that is the same all the way through. And that allows those players to go from the the O nines into the O sixes and not drop a beat because they know the language is the same, then the coaching style is the same, everything was the same. So same with Izzy, who's an 08, good player. She came into the finals and I was even acting my captain. I was asking the coaches, should I start her in the center midfield? Should I start her? She's an 08 playing with the O sixes. And it was very challenging. Right up until kickoff, I did not know if I was going to start her. And I did. And she was excellent. She just made some errors, but she got back and just kept going. So I think the program and the 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 fact that they were all together from the start and they were all bought in, and that's what they gave that team the extra little bit, I would say. I'm always interested in the inspiration side of things. And, you know, when you look at books sometimes, right? So books can, can serve as good inspirations. I, as Ralph knows, I'm an audio book guy. I don't, I don't read. I listen and I'm well listened at this point, but looking for you guys, I mean, one book, one book that's for, for the listeners here, one book that's been either motivational, inspirational, learning, whatever, one book that you would highly recommend to the coaches listening and why Ralph, go with you first. I mean, we have a good to great is a is a is a book that is driven into our coaching staff from the leadership up top. I would have to say that, otherwise Scotty and Steve would be calling me out after this Zoom call for sure. But I would say the biggest inspiration for our girls or the influence to the girls to become who they are and who they are now and how they are getting continuing to develop would be what drives winning. 
I, I have to say that because when we invested that into our into the program and and we bought a book for every single girl in the program and we so we invested all of all of that time and energy we would actually on road trips we would incorporate the book into our team bonding activities or team meetings or team dinners or whatever it may be so i would say that would be the most important or influential book for the program Danny, what about you yeah, I'd, I'd agree with that actually, but I, I I'll probably go from a different angle. Then I'll say that, and you'll laugh, but I, I'll go I'll go Brian Clough's kind of autobiography. Just a you know, just the obviously I'm a massive Forest fan, so it's different, and probably everyone's now switched off. But he kind of embodies a lot of you know, kind of how my journey has been a little bit in the sense of like taking a team you know that's smaller and this that and the other and trying to develop it and make it you know as big as you can and obviously Forrest he took it to another level of obviously taking to European Cups but I think just his kind of the way of his management it's a bit old school in a lot of ways it's not really aligned completely with what I would do but just a general kind of inspiration from it and I think that it's good for coaches to kind of be inspired. You know, we, we talk with our staff about, you know, like Deserby right now, or obviously Pep in the past or, and now, you know, and just having that kind of inspiration from other people who have been in it and obviously are at the top level. Again, trying to take layers from those things is great, but I think the way as a, again, as a, as a big kind of, you know, forest fan and, and I kind of took that on as the, the Brian Clough way of just kind of building something. And that's kind of been a big, part of the way that I've kind of coached and directed in the, in, in the, in the U S well, that's good. Getting perspective from different people. I always felt like in my own life, I've read books mainly or listened to books mainly because of the recommendations of others. I try to listen to people that I feel like I'm generally aligned with and hear what motivates them or, and inspires them. And hopefully some of those books will be uh, turned over to other people listening and serve as that inspiration for them. I'm going to take it a different direction here, just for, for one more question for each of you. I've asked this of myself many times in my own journey as well, and it's a hard question to answer. But if you had to, if you weren't in soccer and you couldn't be in soccer, what would you do? Right. And Danny, we'll, we'll start with you on this one. If, if you had to choose something outside of the game, what would it be and why? That's hard. That's hard. I mean, obviously, been been involved in, in soccer from, you know, the start and, I think sport is just an avenue that my de- I mean, my degree was in sports development. So again, the, just the passion of building and, 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 you know, building something and partnerships and everything else is huge for me, but I think I'd stick in sport. I really do. I think that's been my passion anyway. So I would say, I would say probably, you know, kind of a teacher, PE teacher, something like that. I think that was something that I was going to do originally actually before somebody kind of brought me out to the US to to work in in soccer so um yeah i'm going to cop out and say say pe teacher but yeah it's just the passion for sport passion for teaching and things like that is is something that i think i'd always would have been in, involved in ralph you're still involved in the game right you've moved on from slsg now you're like the ucnl girls commissioner the game the, the siren song of soccer has continued to lure you back in yeah but if you had to leave the game what would it be? Well, obviously, I was a personal trainer first, and I was probably going down the road of being a teacher as well, Danny. So kind of a similar, and, and no surprise, we end up being coaches, right? I was waiting for Jason to kind of bring this one up, actually, because I think he thinks of me as a farmer. <laughs> so um, I am not a farmer, but I would say I would be a rancher. I would be a rancher. I'd be in Montana on a, on a ranch, and I would do that. I think that's what I would do. I've you gotten, didn't expect it, did you? You I've, didn't I've, expect I've it. Gotten, oh, listen, Ralph, I've gotten to know you <laughs> fairly well over the last couple of years. Ralph and I actually coached together in the ECNL National Training Camp years ago on the girls' side in Portland. And we took many runs together in our off hours, and we talked a lot. And nothing about what you just said surprised me whatsoever. <laughs> I, I would have said yes, farmer, rancher, I think is in the same category. I don't know if they're categorically different. I don't know. But you're Probably still not. Kind of in that same that same realm. Since I joined the league, which is about four years ago, a little bit more than four years ago, we've 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 seen tremendous growth in the league. And I think the you know the fun part of this has been meeting people. A lot of those people that I meet, and Ralph can appreciate this now, 
is typically the directors of the clubs off the field issues, right? And a lot of time those encounters are, you're still in the game, but you don't feel like you're part of the game. And the ability to step back into the game on my end now, which I see through coaching my own daughters, but then on the ECNL side, I see by going to events and, and especially, you know, the, the playoffs and the finals, to me, there's just nothing better than those two events. Like just going out and watching clubs. Danny, the, the takeaway for both of you really in 50 years that I'll remember, because I'll still be a well-primed athlete at that time, Ralph, <laughs> more so than you. But the, the thing that I take away, that was the Gatorade bucket being dumped on you, you both. Now, Ralph, I didn't experience it through you. I saw the, the imagery of it. Danny, I was there for it. I think that, you know, not just saying this because Gatorade is one of our prime sponsors here for the, for the league, but those memories, that's the stuff that for me, I walk away from and it was your games, right? Like I, I, you can't see something like that as an athlete and not want to be under that bucket, right? And I think that's the, the magic of this is that you guys have had the, the opportunity to experience that multiple times now, Danny, for you in one season, Ralph, for back-to-back -back seasons, but not many people have that bucket dumped on them, right? And, and it's a little thing like that that goes such a long way because that's so much emotion, so much time, so much energy is everything, right? Kind of exploding out and just enjoying the moment. And I think that for me has been the takeaway by getting to know both of you guys through this game, but seeing it on the field. All right. And I think at the, at the end of the day, we always have Ralph and I, we talk about this quite a bit with leadership of ECNL. We have to always remind ourselves that we are working in the game and we have to focus on the game because a lot of things that you do, i.e. emails with parents and dealing with problems and coaching and recruitment. And, you know, there's a lot of time that's spent off the field away from the game. But at the end of the day, this is about the game and what you guys have both accomplished in the game has been staggering. It's, you know, it's, it takes a lot to do what you both have done. I, I wish you both the absolute best. Ralph, you have to deal with me every single day going forward. But Danny, you know, obviously as you go and work toward your repeat of this, hopefully we have you on the show again next year, right? And and that now is your driving force. And I certainly am in awe of, of working with guys that have accomplished something that I've never been able to accomplish. So kudos to you guys on both of those things. And you know, the, the national championships, the coach of the year, that's recognition from a lot of people that are saying the same thing that I'm saying right now. So Congrats to you guys. Great season. Thanks for joining us on today's show. I will I will turn this over to our, our main host who does this in a much more professional way than I do every single week. Dean Linky, I thank you very much for you guys joining the show and have the best day. Thanks for having us, Jason. Yeah, thank you, guys. Jason Cutney is so good at leading Breaking the Line, the ECNL podcast. Truly enjoyed his time with Ralph Richards, the ECNL Girls National Coach of the Year, and Danny Tonks, the ECNL Boys National Coach of the Year. Well done to all three of them. Also want to thank Andrea Wheeler, Christian Labors, and the rest of the great ECNL staff. And I want to thank you, all of the ECNL members. My name is Dean Linke. We'll see you in two weeks for another edition of Breaking the Line, the ECNL podcast. Thanks for listening to Breaking the Line, the ECNL podcast. For more information on the ECNL, visit us at www.theecnl.com. And if you have a suggestion for the show or a great idea for a guest, please email us at info at theecnl.com. Breaking the Line, the ECNL podcast is an ECNL production. ECNL, more than a league.